What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. I got something I think you're really gonna like. Three player Super Bowl rings from the greatest dynasty to play football, the San Francisco 49ers. Okay. And I also have the presentation boxes as well that come with the rings. All right. This is the one from 1994. This is the one from 1988. And this is from their first Super Bowl ring in 1981. This is really, really cool. Super Bowl 29? This is the one where they beat the Chargers? That is the one where they destroyed the Chargers. Yeah, I grew up being a Chargers fan. Uh, <laughs> definitely, I apologize for that. These are pretty cool. The 49ers, they just dominated the 80s. I mean, in the course of 13 years, they won five Super Bowls. God, that's correct. The whole evolution of Super Bowl rings is pretty cool. The NFL actually has rules on how you can make a Super Bowl ring. Your first Super Bowl ring can only be 10 karat gold, can only weigh so much, only have so much diamonds. I mean, if you look at the original Super Bowl rings, they're more or less glorified class rings, and they slowly got goddier over the years. And uh, in 2001, when the Patriots won the Super Bowl, Kraft basically told the NFL, I don't care what your rules are in a Super Bowl ring, I'm going to do the ring the way I want it. So these are players' rings. You bet they are. Here are times when Pawn Stars came across some diamonds in the rough. Davey, what's up? I need some money. Okay. Got a family heirloom. So check that out. It's a Kunzite. A Kunzite. Kunzite. You sure it's just not a fancy piece of glass? It's been in my family for generations and generations. That's all I know. They only discovered the stone like right around 1900, so it hasn't been in for generations and generations. <laughs> uh, a generation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get 15 grand out of Rick. I mean, it's gotta happen. I'd rather have the money than a pink gem. All right, do you know anything about it? Yeah, I guess it's an evening stone or something. Yeah, the reason they call it an evening stone is because Kunzai can actually fade in sunlight, so it's jewelry you're supposed to wear in the evening. They're really rare. More money? To take. Um, I'm gonna have Jeff, my gemologist, check it out. What, you don't trust me? You don't think it's real? No, I don't. Come on. <laughs> you know it's real. Davey says this is Kunzite. Well, that'd be cool. Let's do some tests. When Rick walked into my office, I was pretty excited because I don't always see Kunzite, let alone of one of this size. Diamond Tiara. Rick is in for a rare treat when a client brings in a stunning diamond tiara. Guy brought in a diamond tiara that belonged to First Lady Ida McKinley. He thinks it's worth 75000 That seems pretty high to me. So I called up my buddy Greg to check this thing out. Oh, there it is. It's like the crown jewels of the United States. <laughs> it's an interesting looking piece. I'm the owner of Fred Layton. We specialize in vintage and antique jewelry, and we help people understand jewelry in the context of historical periods and also understand value. Late 1800s, you saw a lot of jewelry in um, nature motifs, a lot of bird feathers, wings. Pieces like this were quite popular. The diamonds are, are fine quality for the period. They're what you would expect to see. The idea that this was convertible and has the fittings for both the brooch and also the tiara, and I think that's kind of neat. So the question becomes, what do we know about the provenance? How can we substantiate the provenance of the piece itself? It, it's seen in this official White House First Lady photograph. The client sweetens the deal by showing Rick and Greg a photo of Flota's Ida McKinley, wearing the unmistakable piece of lavish jewelry. This is one of the events that was going on at the McKinley Museum, and it's featured there. Well, certainly it does link, in a fairly official way, this piece to Ida McKinley. You know, how much value that adds is, it's a little bit of uh, open to interpretation. What would it go in your store? Well, I think in a retail store like Fred Layton, we would see this piece sell for $75,000. Okay, sort of what he's wanting. So yeah. we're gonna have to talk a little bit, but uh, thanks, man, I appreciate it. My pleasure. There are many collectors, people who have a bashful sense of style, who would actually really appreciate that piece, both as a piece of jewelry and also because of its history. Super Bowl ring. Chum is on top of the world when he tries out a rare iced out ring that Henry has brought for sale. I want to sell a ring today. Okay. Holy. Got the mother of all Super Bowl rings. Let me try that thing on. I feel like a champion. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my 2004 Patriots ring. All right, where did you get this? I'm a broker, and a gentleman came in. Rookie Brian, he's a wide receiver, and did a deal with me, and never really came back to get it. So what, you loaned him some money or something like that? Yeah. This thing weighs a ton. Well, it's from Super Bowl 39. It's when they beat the Eagles, and they went back to back, like it says on the side of the ring. Okay, do you mind if I take a good look at it? Take your time. 
I just really, really don't like this Jostens mark inside it. What's the Jostens mark? Jostens is the company that made a lot of the Super Bowl rings. Well, maybe there's two different marks. No, I mean, this one looks hand engraved. Jeff, bring me my Patriots ring. And with my collection, I have other Super Bowl rings I can compare all the markings with. This is precision machine engraving inside of it. Every Super Bowl ring I've ever had that was made by Jostens is engraved like that. This looks like it's in sloppy hand engraving. I mean, the, the, the workmanship and everything looks wonderful, but that has got me so concerned. So how much were you looking to get out of it? I was in the mid to low 20s. I'm gonna have to get somebody in here because it just doesn't look right. So we'll get this thing figured out, cool. Not ready to gamble on such an expensive item, Rick calls Jeremy, a sports memorabilia expert. Jeremy, how's it going, man? Hey, Rick, what's going on, man? What do you have for me today? We have a 04 Patriots ring. No kidding. Super Bowl 39. At this point, this ring was the heaviest and it was the most expensive ring that they had ever made for any Super Bowl game. It's cast in 14K white gold. It's got 124 diamonds. Okay, I see we got uh, Jostens. Usually you would see that not only in a different location, but it looks to be actually hand engraved rather than actually out of the machine. The diamonds, everything else looks to be legit. Just the market on the bottom there, it's uh, certainly a little bit different than other rings I've seen. But this year is a little bit different than all the other Super Bowl rings in the past. They put so much into this ring, gold, diamonds, and everything. This thing was so enormous, it didn't fit inside Jocelyn's normal ring engraver. They actually had to have somebody laser engrave each and every ring, as you see here. So this ring is 100% legit, and it's uh, pretty awesome. So what do you think it's worth? Super Bowl rings from players such as this sell from about thirty to $35,000. Nice. Thanks, man. You're hey, the you best. Bet. Satisfied with the ring's authenticity, City, Rick initially offers $18,000. So how much do you want for this thing? $22,000. Um, 18. Why so low? Have you seen the economy? Yeah, that's why I got the <laughs> ring. <laughs> so I'm at 18. I go 21. But you don't have anything like this in your showcases. I know you have a Patriots ring, but you don't have that Patriots ring. I'll give you 20 grand. Cash. $100 bills. If you go 20, you go 21. Just because I need a Super Bowl ring for every one of my fingers. Deal. Deal. All right, write them up, chump. Marie Antoinette's diamond buttons. Adam, a rare book dealer, brings Rick an item that is out of his wheelhouse. What can I help you with? Came to sell my buttons. They belong to Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette. Do you know a lot about Marie Antoinette? <laughs> <laughs> I want to sell them because I don't deal in buttons. I'd like to get $10,000. I think they're a very rare set and very unusual. So where did you get these? Well, I'm a rare book dealer. Where there's sometimes really fine books, you find some really interesting objects. What makes you think they belong to Marie Antoinette? On the box is the Bourbon coat of arms, which is something Marie Antoinette would have had on all of her possessions. Yes, the Bourbons were a long line of kings and queens in France. Bourbons was the family name. And after Marie Antoinette was married to Louis the 16th, she became a bourbon. Louis the 16th could not have run the government worse. The utter poverty of the people in France and they're looking at people living in Versailles, living the life of luxury, eventually led to the French Revolution and what are we gonna do with the king and queen? And they just decided, let's just chop their heads off. <laughs> This woman loved living the high life, but the average French person who was basically starving at the time, they got sick of her really quick. After the French Revolution, she was eventually arrested and executed. Despite their famous owner, Rick does not buy into the $10,000 asking price. Do you mind if I look at them? Sure, of course, go ahead. These were called paste diamonds. They're sort of like glass diamond. Paste was a big thing. What it basically is, this is glass with lead melted in it. This is definitely something fancy enough to be worn by a queen. Yeah, from what I understood, it's very rare actually that you would have a set of buttons that survive complete. A complete set is rare. There's a good market for stuff belonging to royals. And Marie Antoinette is one of those historical figures people never stop talking about. But there's a lot of things we have to take into consideration here. So what do you want to do with them? I want to sell them. How much are you looking to get out of them? Ten grand. If they belong to Marie Antoinette, we probably have a deal. But what happened was, is French Revolution, Napoleon came to power, and later he was defeated, and uh, the English put the monarchy back in place in France. When the Bourbons reascended the throne, they modified their crest. And this necklace right here was added. 100% guarantee you this is post-Napoleon. Okay. Which means it can't be Marie Antoinette's because her head was gone by then. <laughs> 49ers Super Bowl rings. Rick practically drools when Scott offers to sell him a set of three-player San Francisco 
49ers football rings. I got something I think you're really going to like. Three player Super Bowl rings from the greatest dynasty to play football, the San Francisco 49ers. Okay. And I also have the presentation boxes as well that come with the rings. All right. This is the one from 1994. This is the one from 1988. And this is from their first Super Bowl ring in 1981. This is really, really cool. Super Bowl 29. This is the one where they beat the Chargers? That is the one where they destroyed the Chargers. Yeah, I grew up being a Chargers fan. Uh, <laughs> definitely, I apologize for that. These are pretty cool. The 49ers, they just dominated the 80s. I mean, in the course of 13 years, they won five Super Bowls. You got it, that's correct. The whole evolution of Super Bowl rings is pretty cool. The NFL actually has rules on how you can make a Super Bowl ring. Your first Super Bowl ring can only be 10 karat gold. You can only weigh so much, only have so much diamonds. I mean, if you look at the original Super Bowl rings, they're more or less glorified class rings, and they slowly got goddier over the years. And uh, in 2001, when the Patriots won the Super Bowl, Kraft basically told the NFL, I don't care what your rules are in a Super Bowl ring. I'm going to do with the ring how I want it. So these are players' rings. You bet they are. You just collect them from different collectors. You get them from the players. Different collectors, conventions, not directly from the players. They're players I've never really heard of. Really? Eric Wright, the starting cornerback for four Super Bowls. You've never heard of him? Pretty okay, well and known. Cook? Toy Cook had interception in the game. And Jeff Fuller's pretty well known as well. These were starters. Rick sees a red flag when he notices that one of the rings has been poorly resized. I don't know if you noticed this one. There's no marks inside of it. I've had the ring authenticated. It okay, does. well, no, I, I can tell you right now, this is a 100% genuine ring. But it's been sized by a really bad jeweler. In my opinion, it brings it down a little bit just because you don't have the markings inside of it and people want to see that. The other ones are like pristine. So how much are you looking to get out of these? I'm looking to get 112500 for all three, which I think is very fair. These are really neat. How'd you acquire these? I got them from some collectors I know. These are pretty rare in my opinion. They make about 150 rings a year. They are very expensive when it comes to the owner of the team buying them. They cost between five and five and a half million dollars to buy the 150 50 rings. So the average price is about $36,000, $37,000. crazy. I just want to take a look. So this ring belonged to Toy Cook. You got to look for the markings. Looks like, yes, yeah, resized. It looks like it was really... Uh, it was done by a really bad jeweler. Yeah, that's true. But uh, it looks like it's authentic. The Jeff Fuller ring from 1988. This is really, really nice. And this is Eric Wright. Very cool. These are definitely genuine 49er Super Bowl rings. They have the right diamonds. They're yellow gold. It's really a great collection of three rings. Scott cannot believe his ears when the expert values the rings at $20,000 each. So what do you think they're worth? Value-wise, Super Bowl rings are very highly collectible. 49ers, they pretty much own the 80s, so there's a lot of demand for 49er rings. I think retail, they're probably in the range of about 20,000 a ring. I think they're worth a lot more than that. And these are very rare to have 49er player rings, especially from this era. You don't see them very common go on the market. They used to be a lot more, but you know that's about what they're commanding these days. So are you gonna budge off that price at all? You know, I wish I. I had Montana and Rice here to argue for me because that was a pretty low price. I'm still a little shell shocked. Uh, I, I, I tell you what, I mean, my best offer would be forty-five thousand for all three of them. Unfortunately, I just I can't part with them for that price. It's just too low. All right, have a good one, man. Change your mind. Call no me. problem. I appreciate. It. Thank you. I was hoping to make a deal, but I would not accept anywhere near that. I'll take my rings and display them at my office till I get a better offer that's more commensurate with what they're worth. Liberace Medallion. Rick and Sean Mraz struck when Kurt offers them a blinged out Liberace medallion. Hey, how can I help you? I have the most important piece of jewelry by a Las Vegas icon, Liberace. That's really, really cool. Bling, bling? What? <laughs> you got some Liberace bling? Yeah. I mean, the guy was pretty amazing. My grandma loved Liberace. And I'm not gonna lie, I got some respect for the guy. So where did you get this? I got it at an auction. Pretty damn cool. I know that he was the highest paid live performer in the world for a good 15 years. Even more than Elvis? More than Elvis. Supposedly the fastest piano player in the world. Liberace was a huge celebrity in his day. And almost 20 years after his death, he still a major icon. So to have one of his signature jewelry pieces would be absolutely amazing. He wore this every day of his life and it was his favorite piece. This piece right here? Yeah. So here's a picture of him wearing it. I have a couple pictures and I have a certificate of authenticity from the auction house which I purchased it from. December 3rd, 2011, you bought it. Yeah. 
Rick quickly offers $10,000 for the iconic piece. It's a cool piece, and this is classic late 70s. You know, they take it in your American gold coin, stick it in there, as many diamonds as you can stuff around it. Yeah. So how much you want for it? I'm looking for $25,000. It's one of those things where it's really hard to come up with a number. A little over three thousand dollars worth of gold, three thousand dollars worth of diamonds. I don't see twenty-five grand here. I just don't. I see ten. You know, I didn't come in here asking for a hundred thousand. I just thought it was totally reasonable asking for twenty-five. How much did you get it for an auction? Uh, I didn't want to disclose that. Ten grand. I think it's a fair offer. Yeah, I can't do it. Well, thanks for bringing it in, man. Okay, thank you. I was already picturing that piece in a display case with a big fat price tag. Lucky Luciano signet ring. David confidently walks into the pawn shop, ready to blow the pawn stars away with a ring that is much more than jewelry. What do we got? Well, I have a piece of antique heirloom jewelry that my mother passed along to me. It was the signet ring of the mafia boss, Lucky Luciano. This used to belong to Lucky Luciano? That was made for Lucky Luciano. I've had it in hiding for 40 years. Why would you have it in hiding? Because this represents his authority. If anybody got possession of this piece, until now, there would have been bloodshed and war within the families. So how did your mom get the ring? There's an individual whose name I cannot use that gave this to my mother. My mother was a woman who did special services for these people because she had their personal confidence. These gentlemen trusted her with things that they couldn't trust anyone else. And she was given it to protect it and to protect them from fighting amongst themselves. Okay. He calls Jonathan a curator of the Los Angeles Mob Museum to authenticate the piece. If it really did belong to Lucky Luciano, it could be worth some huge money to the right collector. Have an idea what you wanted for it? Gonna be six figures. Besides buying it for scrap, I'd have to make sure that he actually owned it before I'd pay any more than that. Believe it or not, Las Vegas has a mob museum. I know the curator of it. This is the one guy that would actually know. So let me give him a call. I'll be right back. Sounds good. This is it. Allegedly the ring of Lucky Luciano. Wow. Lucky Luciano is a very big deal who modernized organized crime. If this is Lucky Luciano's ring, you'd be looking at something that would be worth tens of thousands of dollars. Do you happen to have any photographs or letters that would establish a relationship between your mother and any of these organized crime figures. Not truly. You're the curator of the Mob Museum. I'm sure you've seen thousands of photos of Lucky Luciano. You ever see any of them with that ring or anything like that? This particular design is not something that I'm familiar with. Considering all the information we have, unfortunately, I just don't think we can conclude that this is Lucky Luciano's ring. <sighs> okay. It's just a story. It's a great story. Thanks. <laughs> Kunzite. Davey, Rick's friend and regular client of the pawn shop, offers Rick a shiny gem that has been passed down his family for generations. Rick, what's going on? Davey, what's up? I need some money. Okay. Got a family heirloom. Let's check that out. It's a Kunzite. A Kunzite. Kunzite. You sure it's just not a fancy piece of glass? It's been in my family for generations and generations. That's all I know. They only discovered the stone like right around 1900, so it hasn't been in for generations and generations. Uh, a generation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get 15 grand out of Rick. I mean, it's gotta happen. I'd rather have the money than a pink gem. All right, do you know anything about it? Yeah, I guess it's an evening stone or something. Yeah, the reason they call it an evening stone is because Coon's eye can actually fade in sunlight, so it's jewelry you're supposed to wear in the evening. They're really rare. More money? Um, I'm gonna have Jeff, my gemologist, check it out. What, you don't trust me? You don't think it's real? No, I don't. Come on. <laughs> You know it's real. I thought me and Rick were better buddies because I didn't think he needed to see a gemologist. You know what I mean? He didn't need no fancy machine to see that it was real. He could trust me. Jeff, the geologist, admits that he has never come across such a huge piece of kunzite. What's up, man? Davey says this is kunzite. Well, that'd be cool. Let's do some tests. When Rick walked into my office, I was pretty excited because I don't always see kunzite, let alone of one of this size. All stones have clarity characteristics which can help identify them. If it's glass, most likely there's gonna be air bubbles. And so what I can see in here are inclusions that tell me that this is natural. So far, good news, right? Yeah, yeah. But I won't know if it's a natural kunzite until I do other tests. It's a Not kunzite. Yet. We're gonna find out if you're lying. This is a refractive index machine, and it measures the way light goes through the stone. And from that, we can tell if this is a natural kunzite or if it's something else. And as I can see through here, it has the right refractive index to be kunzite. So yes, this is a real kunzite. It is a natural kunzite. Ah, I told you, I told you it was real. How much money? How much does this go for? Something of this nature, with this size and with this color, I'd probably estimate 30 to $50 a carat. Okay, how many carats is it weigh? 
323.8 carats. So we're talking at $30 a carat, right at 9,600 bucks, right in that neighborhood? Yeah, ballpark. All right, thanks, Jeff. 30 to $50 a carat gives us a retail value of somewhere between nine and $16,000. Knowing Davey, he's gonna try and squeeze me for all it's worth. <laughs> well, it's real. I feel it's worth 15 grand. 9,600 if I need one. I don't need one, okay? It's big. It deserves big money. Happy that his friend was not trying to con him, Rick offers Davey $5,000. I'll give you five grand. I mean, just plain and simple, it's gonna sit for a long time. 15 grand, five grand, 10 grand. I'll go 10 Gs. No. Please? I have to mount it in something which is going to cost me a fortune because it's going to use a lot of gold because it's going to be a big mounting. Where are we going to end? Meet in the middle? 7500 I'll, I'll give you six grand. 7500 Six grand. 65 I mean, things like that. You're winning. I was at 15 grand. Come on, Rick. Be a little bit more reasonable. All right, 65. All right. I don't hate Rick. <laughs> I like doing business with Rick and Corey. But, you know, sometimes they win, sometimes I win. I mean, uh, this one, they won. 